Welcome to Present Perfect. No grammar, but plenty of history. I'm Don Congdon, your host and guide, helping you explore how the past reaches out and touches the present. This is podcast number 104. When you get ready to tackle a challenging subject like church history, it's important to start at the right place. We've laid a good foundation by examining historical study in general. Now it's time to get specific. But where's the right place to begin? After much thought, I decided to follow the King of Hearts advice to the White Rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. Begin at the beginning, and go on till you come to the end, then stop. So what is the beginning? Nothing could be simpler. I need to tell you about my presuppositions. While that sounds rather heavy, it's actually very basic. Presuppositions are the foundations upon which our thinking, evaluating, and judging rest. Everything springs out of these fundamental assumptions. We all have them, and nobody can be free from them. For our presuppositions significantly affect how we view things. Essentially, they're the starting place of our worldview. This explains why two people, studying the same Bible, with the same diligence and sincerity, can come to totally different conclusions about the same subject. This is the reason that we have dispensationalism, New Calvinism, Covenant Reform theology, and many other theological systems. This is the reason that some people are amillennial, some are premillennial, some are postmillennial, and some just can't decide what to believe. It all comes down to those starting assumptions. I need to tell you about my presuppositions so you'll know what I believe. They're going to color my whole interpretation of history. Now perhaps you're thinking that I need to get my biases under control and take a totally objective view of history. Don't kid yourself. There's no such thing as total objectivity. It's a myth. Every historian begins with a set of presuppositions that influences the way he or she approaches history. Historians shouldn't be pursuing an El Dorado of total objectivity. Instead, they need to be open and honest about their presuppositions. They need to recognize how their presuppositions influence their work. Those presuppositions must be well-reasoned and consistent. They also need to be as free as possible from prejudice, which is quite different from bias. Biases are simply one's viewpoints seen through the lens of one's presuppositions. A prejudice, on the other hand, is an irrational view springing from one's emotions and social conditioning. People hang on to them tenaciously and won't be talked out of them by reasoned argument. Prejudices can lead to all kinds of undesirable behavior and have been the mainspring of many historical events, including atrocities. For the purposes of our current study, my theological presuppositions are one of the things I need to be open and above board about. I've got them, just like any other teacher, pastor, or scholar. You need to know where I'm coming from so what I teach will make sense. My theology follows what is known as the dispensational model. Perhaps you've heard of it. Perhaps not. It begins with a very basic question. What is God's purpose for history? Or to put it even more simply, we just ask a very big, why? God being infinite and man being finite, we cannot answer this question fully. But I think the Bible makes it fairly clear that God's purpose for creation is both basic and profound, to manifest himself and his attributes. God didn't need a creation to complete himself, and contrary to what's often taught in Sunday school, God wasn't a bit lonely. But God chose creation as a means to manifest himself, and he did it through the concept of a kingdom and a king. The earth is the center of the kingdom, and Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is its designated king. By choosing sin and rejecting God's command, Adam brought a curse upon the earth and mankind as a whole. But God's plan still moves forward, and the kingdom is still its goal. If you take away just one thing from this podcast, 
it should be this. The kingdom is central to God's plan and therefore to all of history. Over time, God has interacted with humankind in different ways. Theologians call these interactions divine economies. Sometimes, God interacted with individuals. On other occasions, he interacted with a whole nation. Today, he interacts with a body of true believers known collectively as the church. At some point in the future, he'll interact once again with the nation of Israel. And at a still later point in time, Jesus Christ will physically rule and reign over the earth as its king. Each major economy forms a period in history known as a dispensation. It is not my purpose to discuss dispensationalism here, as that's a subject for a whole series of podcasts. But we must understand the basic idea of a dispensation to see where the church fits in the plan. And we must remember that our dispensation is not a continuation of, nor a replacement for the previous one, that is, the one focused upon the nation of Israel. The church is unique in history, just as Israel is unique, but they are not the same, and they were never intended to be the same. Romans chapter 11 makes this concept crystal clear. It is on this particular point that other theological models differ. Reform theology, for example, disagrees with many of these presuppositions. Consequently, its whole interpretation of history leans in a different direction. This is the reason that you need to know a teacher or writer's presuppositions. Beginning a journey by taking a different road could well land you at a different destination. Another presupposition that I must mention has to do with what I consider my source for theological facts. It's also the standard by which I build and test my theological model, which in my case is dispensationalism. As you can guess from what I've already said, my standard is the collection of 66 books known as the Bible. Not only do I regard it as the ultimate source of truth, I also consider it the key to history. We learn about the beginning of history from Genesis, and we know its ultimate destination from Revelation. Everything in between divides up into the various dispensations. A sizable chunk of the biblical record deals with the dispensation in which God focused upon the nation of Israel, his special chosen people. During this period, God interacted with Israel both individually and nationally. He sent lawgivers and mediators like Moses, judges like Samuel, kings like David, and prophets like Daniel. But the focus of all their messages was the coming kingdom and its king, the Messiah. God's people were to be the subjects of the kingdom, and for that they must be in a right relationship with their king, both nationally and individually. But fallen human nature and sin prevented either from happening on a permanent basis. Both Israel as a nation and its individual citizens had periods of right relationships with God, but as the Old Testament makes very evident, perfection just wasn't possible. Redemption was a necessary step before a kingdom would be possible. And here again, the Bible makes it very clear that God acts through the medium of history. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 say, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. God made a genuine offer of the kingdom to Israel during the period of Jesus Christ's ministry on earth. His actions during the triumphal entry, which we celebrate today as Palm Sunday, make it clear that a physical kingdom could have come to Israel right then and there. Many accepted him as Messiah, but the leadership, the official representatives of the nation, rejected him. What could have happened is one of the interesting what-ifs of history. Despite some of the philosophical complications, I am confident that the kingdom could have come right then had Israel nationally accepted Jesus as Messiah. Unfortunately for Israel, their leadership officially rejected him. Consequently, the kingdom was delayed, 
but not thwarted. Today we await the beginning of events that will culminate in the kingdom. Now perhaps you're thinking that I'm making too much of an issue over theological presuppositions. If so, you're not alone. Many people regard one's theological presuppositions as unimportant beyond what's called the primary doctrinal level. They agree that we must hold certain fundamental ideas in common, the virgin birth, salvation by grace through faith, the inspiration of the Bible, and so on. But they believe that it's fine to differ on the so-called secondary doctrines, such as eschatology, that is, things to come. This viewpoint is common in American fundamentalism today. When I was in college in the 1980s, I heard it in many forms from many well-known speakers. Unfortunately, comfortable as this idea is, it's wrong. Our interpretation of past history and our understanding of future history are colored by the filter of our theological assumptions. Two people can't hold significantly different presuppositions and expect to wind up in the same place theologically. The theological system known as replacement theology is an excellent example of this principle. It too believes in a kingdom, but its kingdom is largely spiritual. Instead of waiting for a point in the future in which he'll rule and reign over a literal earthly kingdom, Jesus Christ rules and reigns today over an invisible kingdom in the hearts of men. Instead of being on hold for a future role in history, Israel has been permanently replaced by the church as a result of disobedience and rejection. The promises of the Old Testament now belong to the church, and the church should follow much of the Old Testament law. Instead of a future kingdom on the earth, the future kingdom culminates in heaven. Rather than being removed from the earth prior to a horrific seven-year time of judgment called the tribulation, the church will experience this event. Jesus Christ won't reign on the earth for a thousand years prior to the coming of the new heavens and the new earth. And history as we know it wraps up in a single event known as the Last Judgment, in which all humans, from all periods of history, play an active role. I think you get the idea. Start in a different place and you'll almost certainly wind up in a different place. And that's all for today. I hope I've whetted your appetite for more. In the future, I plan to spend more time developing the big ideas of dispensational theology. And just a teaser, this form of dispensationalism is not the version found in the Schofield Reference Bible. In our next podcast, however, we begin a series that looks at our one and only source of certainty, the Bible. We're going to examine its history and see where the Bibles that we use today come from. We'll explore Bible translation and the versions that have resulted from translation. Finally, we'll develop some principles for evaluating and choosing a translation. So until next time, I'm Don Congdon, and this is Present Perfect. Have a great day. Present Perfect is a copyright of Don Congdon. Music is copyright Footage Firm Incorporated. Scripture quotations are from the New American Standard Bible, which is a copyright of the Lachman Foundation.